But moving on to uh, George, and you, you can see his bio on, on the web. He's, got, he's won so many awards, you know, I can't even really grasp it, but uh, Emmy Awards, Peabody Awards, you name it, and uh, the man has, has won these awards. And for journalism, he started out as a straight journalist, as straight as they come, I guess, and he got caught up in this uh, UFO maelstrom, if, if you will. And as far as my awareness of George Knapp, just even as a person, it began several years ago when uh, the Fund for UFO Research used to sponsor a lot of activities. And one of them was like just a meeting of the UFO mines, and it was like a weekend in uh, DC. And one of these UFO mines was Calm Kelleher. And Calm Kelleher started telling us these blood curdling stories over dinner about this crazy ranch, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, whatever you want to call it, Foster Ranch, where these amazing things were, were happening. And the thing I thought was most amazing is he, would, he, he could occasionally throw in four letter words, you know, right there at the dinner table in this kind of stuffy atmosphere. I just thought, wow, I can't, this guy's really letting it fly. But he was that shook up by these events. And then he started saying, you know, this article is about to come out. Uh, it's a two-part article in Vegas, and uh, there might be a book, and you won't believe the crazy stuff that's been going on. And we were just amazed and transfixed by it all. So that was the beginning of it, and the, the book is fantastic. I understand that George has about 30 books, so um, there's one for everybody, or maybe not quite 30, but whatever he, he's been able to muster together. Uh, it's definitely a, a spellbinding, see your, see your pants kind of read. Uh, you know, it's got, it's got orbs and lights and portals and, and strange creatures and weird humanoids and you name it, it's got it. So it's something for everyone. And without any further ado, the award winning, the amazing George Knapp. <laughs> uh, thank you all for having me. It's uh, great to be here on such a beautiful day. Um, <laughs> I spilled out of the plane about midnight last night wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts. People kind of looked at me like I was crazy, but that's not the first time that's happened. Uh, never let it be said that, you know, my spooky stories get uh, stale or moldy. Uh, I am here today, of course, to share with you tales about skinwalkers, which, as we'll learn, are shapeshifters. And damned if we don't have a fresh incident, uh, as we say in the news biz, hot off the presses, ripped from the headlines, a new report, a news report about an insidious uh, shapeshifter which uh, raised its evil head just uh, in the last past couple of weeks in Africa, in Zimbabwe. And uh, this story, I printed it out for you so you have to believe me. Uh, the title is Hooker Turns Into Donkey. And uh, it's, about a, uh, it's about an African man who was caught in the act of having sex with this donkey in his yard, uh, and, which is fairly heinous and disturbing but not as uh, disturbing as the explanation he gave because he was in court on Monday of this past week and he told the judge that this donkey, which had been tied up uh, to a tree by its neck and was sitting there in his yard when he was doing this deed, uh, the donkey actually had been a woman. Uh, that he met her in a bar, she was a prostitute, he paid her $20 in advance, took her home, and then somewhere in between when he got caught and, and the bar, uh, this woman morphed into a donkey, and that was his explanation. Uh, I don't know if this is just the latest example of the insidious, uh, devious type stuff that shapeshifters have been known to do. I mean, who among us is going to believe that man's story? You know, it's, it's obviously that this is exactly how the skinwalker planned it, uh, so that this love-starved guy would be dragged into court and then uh, be forced to undergo psychiatric examination. Uh, it's been almost six years December will mark six years since our book, uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker, came out, as, as mentioned uh, by Sue, uh, co-written by Dr. Colm Kelleher. And of course, I remain interested in, in stories of strange and paranormal events, uh, things that, that might mirror the activity of, of what we report on from that corner of, of Northeast Utah and at this ranch uh, that's the focus of the book. But I'm, I'm also, I'm just as interested as a reporter in public reaction to this stuff, in, in what you see and how the public, various segments of the public react. Uh, many years ago, some of you may know, when I first became interested in UFOs, paranormal stuff, it was back in the late 80s, uh, it was about a, a tiny little area uh, known as Area 51. And, um, and outside of Nevada, outside the CIA, very few people in the world had heard of it, except for people who had worked out there. It had no uh, profile whatsoever. Today, of course, it's a household name, it's known all over the world. A lot of that is because of the stories that we started about Bob Lazar and flying saucers and things of that sort. Uh, and 
in the ensuing 23 years or so since those stories broke about flying saucers being tested and stored out there, it's been fascinating to observe how the public has reacted, various segments of the public. I mean, there's, of course, overt hostility from my brethren in the mainstream media who just simply don't like it. They've, they've uh, trashed me pretty much every, every imaginable possible way, which, you know, who cares? Uh, um, but at the same time, in the last 23 years, every major news organization in the world has beaten a path to Area 51's door and has done stories out there. Then you have uh, feigned indifference, I think, from military and intelligence circles. You have ridiculous gullibility uh, among some of our friends in the UFO true believer community who think that everything out there is a flying saucer from Zeta Reticuli or something. You have a considerable amount of exploitation on the part of those who uh, who have developed their own agenda about Area 51. They've added on layers of really increasingly crazy stuff to make the story even wilder than it was, and it was pretty wild to begin with. You know, milk carton kids are being taken to Area 51 to have horrible medical experiments uh, performed on them. Uh, the stories about aliens from the planet Krondak that are secretly running the underground base. And I'm not making this stuff up, but somebody surely did. I had uh, sort of a front row seat to all this stuff as it unfolded and, and spilled out into the world and is still spilling out, and it's sort of the same thing with the Utah Ranch. Same kind of wide spectrum of reactions, the same sort of hostility, even within UFO and paranormal fields where you would think people would be kind of interested in what was going on. And again, it's been fascinating to watch this as it plays out, but not as much fun because of the nature of the kinds of things that have happened out there, the outright destructive activity uh, that did not happen with the Area 51 story. I, for example, right now, uh, I haven't been to the ranch in two years, but uh, they've got 24 hour, 24 seven security, armed security, these guys who work for Bigelow Aerospace who are now there because it's been overrun. I mean, people in the middle of the night trespassing onto the property, going up to the ranch, taking pictures in the house where these people live, flash cubes, they have, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, beer parties throwing trash all over the place. A couple of weeks ago, uh, unseen forces ripped this heavy gate off the front of the ranch. The unseen force, I think, was a pickup truck, somebody who just who, who felt the public has a right to know what goes on on that public, uh, that privately owned property, and therefore the fence had to go. So they've had to install these uh, bunkers up there um, where you have to weave in to get into the only road that goes into, into the ranch. and and um, you know, it, it's, been, it's been unfortunate. I understand that people would be interested in the property and what goes on there that they want to observe, but uh, it's kind of taken it too far. And I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk here because um, the Utah Ranch and its owner uh, are now in the crosshairs of a cable TV series, a network program that you may have heard of, um, Jesse Ventura's Conspiracy Theory. I don't know if anybody from the show is here or not, or whether you have actually, any of you have seen it. I imagine some of you have. Uh, but it's exactly what that title implies, Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory. Uh, I made the unfortunate decision a year ago to, to appear on, on the show. And, I, you know, it's, it's been a lot of years I decided I didn't want to do these things anymore, shows about Area 51, because they keep doing the same stuff over and over. And how many times can you say the same thing? So I sort of bailed out. But I was kind of curious about meeting Jesse Ventura. So, um, you know, he's kind of a force of nature, interesting guy. So I agreed to do the interview. He comes to town, interviewed him about Area 51. He had a theory about what was going on out there. That was all government disinformation and what the real aim was. And it didn't matter what I or anybody else said. That was what's going to be, you know. And that's what it ended up. And it was really embarrassing, the final product, the kinds of lengths they went to make it look spooky and mysterious. And they're interviewing secret witnesses in a van in the desert and just made it up. And anything that was contrary to that theory was, again, um, you know, tossed out. So it was a preconceived idea. They discarded anything or any evidence or information that conflicted with the preconceived theory. And, and now they're going after Skinwalker Ranch and Bob Bigelow. And I'm told that uh, the focus of the story is not so much the ranch, although that will get trashed as well, but it's Bigelow, who's a, he's a billionaire. He's a very successful guy. He's made a lot of money in real estate and, and in the hotel business, and he has probably spent more money uh, on UFO research than any single person in the history of the world. And every time he gives money to UFO groups, you know how that works. You know how it goes. It's a disaster. 
So he gave some money. I don't know all the particulars about this uh, arrangement that he had with MUFON to set up something called the STAR team, but it seemed like it sounded a pretty good deal. Give them a bunch of money, let them go out and do boots on the ground research into UFO cases. And the result is that he's been pretty much trashed uh, by some people who used to work for MUFON. Uh, I, I kind of looked into it. I talked to Antonio Hineas' uh, compadre, uh, Alejandro Rojas, who used to work for MUFON. I interviewed a guy named Richard Lang, who was the head of the STAR team that went out uh, into the field. They have all told me there was no dastardly plot by Bob Bigelow. He's not working for the CIA. They did not steal all of MUFON's files. But I, I imagine that that is going to be the focus of this thing. And along the way, um, the Skinwalker Ranch is going to be trashed as well. So I thought what is happening in the Uinta Basin uh, is not something that Bob Bigelow in invented or the CIA invented. Uh, it's not something I think that the CIA can control. It's something else entirely. Um, it's something I think much bigger and more mysterious, something in a way that's more wondrous than, than anything the CIA can do. It's, it is scary at times, it's spooky, it's weird. It's the kind of stuff that raises the hair on your neck. It's that kind of creepy. Uh, but it's not something I think it can be weaponized or controlled. And I'm not sure it is something we can even understand. And maybe at the end of this little chat here, you'll know what I mean. I, I'm gonna, I have some video I'm gonna show. Is there, you're gonna, I gotta, my lovely assistant is gonna help me with this because I'm a technical lunkhead. Um, okay. Well, today I thought we could sort of talk about some of the highlights of the activity in the Uinta Basin region, and why I think it's important, and uh, what it might be trying to tell us about the nature of reality. And, and I thought we could start by hearing from the guy who owns the ranch, the man who, uh, as I said, put more of his own money into uh, UFO research than I think anybody in history who's been, but who's, as, as a result of his activity, has been vilified and condemned and, and uh, viewed by with nothing but suspicion, I think, by the, by the people that he's trying to, uh, trying to help. And I, I'm not here to defend Bob Bigelow. I don't work for Bob Bigelow, but uh, I think he's, yes. Is that the first? Yep. But I think he's got sort of a raw deal from some of the people who uh, travel in our circles like this. So I thought we would start with, uh, with a, a couple of comments from Bob about things that happened on the ranch. Uh, he doesn't uh, grant many, many interviews. I conducted the first one he ever gave on camera back in 2007. He's loosened up a little bit, and I am told, I think, that the Jesse Ventura people uh, have actually caught him at a space conference and started interviewing him without telling him really what was going on. I have no idea how that's going to turn out, but I can imagine. Sorry. That's the second uh, piece, okay. so you're looking for the first one on that. Uh, right there. Here he talks about sort of this panorama of weirdness that happened on the ranch and how uh, sort of getting a handle on it has been very difficult to do. Themselves and I, you know, each time there would be a performance of a sort, uh, there was always some unique pattern. There was something that it was always changed. So we would be prepared that if this thing, this, this type of event happened again, we know what to do. Well, that exact same event never happened again. Be something that they would do. We were always out guest. Every time we, we would uh, come up with uh, some method of uh, observation or calibration, that uh, we were always out guest as to what was going to, you know, how we were going. To, and so it, it, it became obvious that <clears throat> we obviously weren't the ones in control. We were along for the ride, and that a lot of these ex exhibitions were exhibitions for gamesmanship or instruction, um, you know, in, in that kind of context. The phenomena was playing with us and um, giving us only a taste here and there of various things, an opportunity to see things that were abnormal, uh, an opportunity to cause examinations upon performances of things that were very unique through certain pathological kinds of investigations. And those were opportunities that were very helpful. Um, so, in, so in terms of witnessing things, we witnessed things both on camera and in person that um, we were privileged to witness. That we, we could have easily not had any opportunities. If the, if the phenomenon did not want us to observe anything, 
then we wouldn't have observed anything. In the uh, years that Bob Bigelow's team was at the, the ranch, uh, seven years that the this study took place, uh, there was more than 150 incidents that were investigated. We can stop that now, yeah. Uh, 150 incidents that the scientists either saw for themselves or investigated, and uh, they really don't have an explanation for them. Uh, not the same thing never happened twice. Uh, talk about non-reproducible. You know, the idea was that science would go there and investigate this. Well, I'll tell you, science got its ass kicked by whatever is on that property. Uh, and you notice that, uh, that Bob Bigelow used the term performance, and that's what it sort of was like. This stuff would happen, it would roll out, and people would see it, and it never happened again. It was like a display. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. I've been to the ranch 13 times, never seen anything that could be described as paranormal. Obviously, I don't, either I don't need to see it, or uh, I'm not uh, smart enough to figure it out, or whatever, but whatever it is, it's very frustrating for me all the time that I spend on the property. Uh, and uh, the same was true for a long time for Bob Bigelow. It's not necessarily true now. I think no incident to better sort of exemplifies the idea that this is a performance uh, nature, the activity on the Utah ranch, than the one that sort of kicked it off for the family that I want to talk about. I call them in the book the Gormans. Uh, their name is well known. It had been made public in newspaper articles prior to us writing the book. But NIDS, the people from Bigelow's organization, made a deal. They said, we're not going to drag your name into it at any time. We'll keep it out. So we honored, honored that in the book. And uh, we've been vilified for it, for trying to sanitize the whole thing. But that was the deal that was made, and we, we stuck to it. If you wanted to know who their names, their names are, you could find it out, because it's public information. Uh, this family consisted of four members. The father, college-educated guy who specialized in, in high, uh, these, these highly bred uh, special cattle, uh, seven tall cattle, that were very expensive. His wife was a savvy professional woman who worked at a bank. Their two kids, these teenagers, were both straight-A students, just a rock-solid good family. And they moved to this ranch in northeastern Utah near Fort Duchesne, sort of as a dream come true. It was going to be their home to raise these high-end cattle, and it was, a, you know, it was everything they'd ever wanted. This ranch itself is 480 acres in uh, northeastern Utah near Fort Duchesne. The property consists of three former homesteads that were all lumped together into one property. There's only one way in, one road. It goes right by the main ranch house and one way out, same road. Uh, on one side of the property, it's bordered by this thicket of trees and bushes and a creek running behind that. On the other side is this giant red sandstone ridge that we came to know as Skinwalker Ridge, and I'll explain the origin of that name a little bit later. Um, on the first day this family moves in, they're unloading their stuff in, their, in the yard out by this corral, and they see across this way toward the tree line a large animal. And it looked like a big dog at first, and then they're talking to each other. No, it's not a dog, it's a wolf. And they're saying, you know, we didn't even realize there were wolves in this territory, and of course there haven't been for hundreds of years. This wolf starts walking towards them, they're thinking to themselves, this must be somebody's pet wolf that's wandering around here, because it's kind of zigzagging, slow, its eyes are down, uh, as if it's being docile, getting closer and closer. It gets within 10 feet of the family, and they could smell it. It had been raining that day, and they could smell it, it was a wet dog kind of a smell. The thing starts walking toward them, and, and uh, the family's getting kind of e at ease with this thing being among them. Obviously, it's not a ferocious wild beast or not acting like one. After a couple of minutes of standing around, this thing leaps into the air. It jumps like 15 feet into the air toward the corral where they had unloaded these calves. Bad decision. Most of the calves were standing in back. Uh, all as far away from that wolf as they can get. One of them had made the unfortunate decision to stick its nose out through these big bars. This wolf leaps through the air, grabs this calf by its snout, and starts pulling it, trying to pull it out of the, uh, out of the corral. The rancher jumps into, into, into action. He grabs, I think it was an axe handle, either axe handle or baseball bat, and beats this thing over the back. Now, this thing is big. Uh, the middle of its back, it must have weighed 200 pounds, they described it later. The middle of its back, I mean, the top of its back comes up to the rancher, the middle of his chest, so it's big. He hits this thing on the back as hard as he could with the, with the stick. It doesn't even budge. He sends his kid, his son, to the truck. He has a, a 357 handgun in, in the truck, and the kid comes back with it, and he pops this wolf once. He pops it a second time, and that's nothing. There's no blood. There's no shriek. There's no reaction from the wolf at all. He sends his father the woman's father-in-law, into the house to get uh, a 30-30. And uh, it comes back out. He says, everyone, uh, 
back off a little bit, shoots this wolf again, and then it's, it stops. This shot caused it to stop and drop the, uh, drop the calf, uh, which was, you know, bleeding and, and almost passed out. And then he takes aim right in the middle of this wolf's chest. Can't understand why it's not reacting. This is the fifth shot, I think, right through the chest, and a chunk of meat and fur flies off. This thing doesn't die. Not only doesn't die, it doesn't uh, exhibit any kind of distress at all. It kind of casually walks away and starts strolling back in the direction that it had come from. And the rancher's looking at his family and thinking, wow, I can't quite figure out what was going on. He and his son, his son grabs another weapon. They decide we can't leave a powerful animal like this that's wounded wandering around our property, so they go after it. And they go walking out into that thicket area where the, the creek is just beyond it. They're having little trouble following the thing because they're catching glimpses of it through the thickets and the trees as they're coming behind it, but they're following these tracks and the tracks are, it's muddy ground, and the tracks are two, three inches into the dirt because this thing is so heavy. They get out to this clearing area, it's like 40 yards across, they follow the tracks into the clearing area, right into the middle of it, and they stop. They just disappear, as if this thing had just vanished into thin air. Now, there's no way it can jump out of there without leaving some kind of tracks. They would see it, but it was gone. They look at each other and wonder, and they're wandering back to the house wondering, what are we going to tell uh, the wife and daughter about this thing? Obviously, it's the first day in their dream property, and they're, they're upset about it. As they get back, they notice that the chunk of fur and flesh that had been shot off this thing was laying there on the grass, and the rancher picked it up, and it smelled like rotten meat, like it had been out there in the sun baking for a couple of days, like something that would be maggot infested. Now, I've had a lot of people who've heard this story say, well, gosh, they should have saved that. You know, they could have solved the mystery, and they're right, you know, and it's driven us all crazy in the, in the years since. They could have maybe solved that mystery if they'd saved it, but they're not UFO investigators. They're not Bigfoot cryptozoologist hunters or something like that. They're ranchers, and they want to put this behind them so they didn't save it. Subsequently, months later, many months later, after Bigelow and his team got involved, they did sort of a a lineup like you would do for a criminal suspect. And they showed the family members different photos and drawings of different wolf species. And they all picked the same one. And the one they picked out was called, is called a dire wolf. And it's been extinct for 10,000 years. So that was day one of the property and things got weird from there. Um, there are really two stories to consider at, at, when you're dealing with this ranch property and the Uinta Basin. One is about the ranch itself, the unusual events that happened there, and we'll get into some really good ones here in a moment, and this bewildered, brave family that tried to deal with them. The second story is sort of a scientific adventure story, an attempt by legitimate, credentialed scientists to investigate and explore and confront the unknown, something that, as we all know in this room, the scientist establishment is often uh, reluctant to do. It was uh, the study that was undertaken is not perfect. I mean, there is no blueprint for doing this kind of thing. I, I know there's a lot of people who said, oh, you should have done it this way or you should have done that. Really, you know, I mean, they're playing it really by the seat of their pants in reacting to a lot of the phenomena that I'm going to be telling you about. But in general, uh, they tried to approach it without preconceptions. They had no idea what the, this started, uh, what, what was responsible for all this activity. And they still don't. And as I mentioned, I think science did attempt to solve this mystery, and science got its butt kicked. And, uh, and um, maybe that's part of the lesson that we'll discuss about. Uh, in the end, though, they spent seven years there at this property. They're 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with some exceptions. They had cameras installed. They had scientific equipment and monitoring gear. They did all kinds of tests. They interviewed people in the area, the Native Americans, the fellow ranchers, the family itself. They investigated backgrounds. They did what scientists are supposed to do. Uh, and it was dangerous for them. It was dangerous uh, not only in a physical sense, and I'll tell you about that, but also in a professional sense. I mean, this is crazy stuff. How does this help your career? What, what paper do you write? What journal do you print this stuff in? Since uh, you know, this is a UFO gathering here, we'll talk a little bit about UFOs, the various shapes and sizes that popped up on the, on the property, but it's not really a UFO story because so many other things happen there that aren't in the category of UFOs or flying saucers. And I know in some ways uh, we don't like to do that. We don't like to expand it too far and include too much paranormal stuff, but 
I'm kind of hoping that they are somehow related, that the ultimate explanation is somehow related because it says uh, the great Jacques Vallée once told me in an interview, he said, I'm going to be greatly disappointed if it turns out that the answer to the UFO mystery is just people traveling here from other planets. And I, I sort of share his anticipation that, that maybe it, it will suggest to us that the world is far more ambitious, far more wondrous than any of us can imagine. Um, regarding the ranch, the 480 acres, it had been previously divided into three homesteads. Uh, the first building uh, on the property after you go into the, into the gate is the primary residence. And then further on down are some other older abandoned properties that, uh, where a lot of spooky stuff happened. And um, I will set the scene further for you by telling you a little bit about this region. The Uinta Basin has been sort of a hot spot of paranormal stuff for as long as people have been living there. Um, it's, uh, and why? I don't know. I mean, it's rich in hydrocarbons. There's sort of a little mini oil boomlet that's been going on there the last couple of years. Uh, about 90% of the people who live there are uh, white folks, Mormons, hardworking. The other 10% are Ute Indians. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had set aside a bunch of land after he kicked the Utes on all the other property that had been taken over. And, um, and in fact, the ranch itself, the ranch we're talking about, is completely surrounded by reservation property. Uh, the Utes, uh, of course, are, are a modern society. They're not very wealthy, but they have their own government, their own police force. Uh, they get along pretty well with the white population there. However, they have a history of being very fierce people. This is a fierce tribe. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they terrorized and dominated other tribes, not only in Utah, but what is today Colorado, New Mexico, uh, I guess parts of Arizona. Um, and, um, you know, they're also in their own way devout and spiritual in ways that uh, Anglos don't often understand. For some reason, as I said, the basin has been a hot spot for a long time. There are records of the uh, sp first Spanish missionaries that passed through there in the late 1700s, has these things flying over their campfires that we today would call UFOs. The Utes themselves have oral traditions dating back at least 15, 16 generations that are filled with the kind of stories that, that, that thrill us. I mean, UFOs, Bigfoot, animal mutilations, malevolent, malevolent unseen forces, spirit forces, things of that sort. In more modern times, the basin has been a UFO hotbed. For at least 50 years, people have been seeing these things. There have been thousands and thousands of witnesses. If you go to the basin and start asking around, just about everybody you talk to has either had a sighting or they know somebody in their family that's had a sighting. And it's been that way for a long time. In, in 1974, a guy named uh, Dr. Frank Salisbury wrote an excellent book called The Utah UFO Display. He used the term display, and I think it's significant, as you heard Bob Bigelow call it a performance, and it's sort of, I think, in the same vein. Salisbury's book was based on the research of a guy named Junior Hicks, who was a uh, science teacher in that area. He'd been there, been teaching for 30 plus years. He taught uh, the white kids, the Indian kids, uh, science classes, and because he was trusted uh, and developed an interest in hearing some of these UFO stories, whenever somebody would have one, that's where they'd go. Junior Hicks developed a, a catalog of more than a thousand cases that he had, uh, had investigated himself, uh, dating back to 1951, including these daylight saucer landings and sightings, humanoid occupants, close encounters, missing time, and at a later date, uh, mutilated animals. So he develops this big pile of stuff. Um, Dr. Salisbury used it as the basis of his uh, book. It also became the basis of, of a lot of what uh, the NIDS team, the Bigelow scientists, were to do. Um, Junior Hicks said this about the ranch, and I got a chance for my first visit to spend a couple hours with him. In his opinion, it is the epicenter of the whole shebang. It's the single weirdest spot in this whole sea of weirdness that is the Uinta Basin. Hicks is the person who first told me that the ranch is, quote, in the path of the skinwalker, according to his friends and uh, contacts within the Ute tribe. And I, I thought, what? What was that? In the path of the skinwalker? Yeah, in the path of the skinwalker. And then I learned what the skinwalker was, and, and that became the title of those, uh, the articles that then eventually became uh, the book. I didn't know what a skinwalker was. I'd never heard this stuff before, and I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but it basically, in Native American lore, uh, a skinwalker, which probably is worth its own show at some point, is uh, sort of a mystifying phenomena. It's a, uh, a Native American witch. It's a sorcerer, a, an evil presence, a shapeshifter that can assume animal form and the powers of what other, whatever animal it, uh, 
it changes into. And uh, you know, while it might sound, sound like quaint tribal mysticism or something, we learned uh, in the course of investigating the book that uh, Native Americans take this seriously. We could never get any of them to speak on the record to be attributed uh, about skinwalkers, and still can't. I, I know that National Geographic a couple of weeks ago had a show about the Navajo uh, police, and they talked a little bit about skinwalkers, and I was amazed that they would do it because what we were told is if you talk about it, you invite it into your life, and they take this very, very seriously. As mentioned, uh, the Utes were pretty tough customers, and for a couple of centuries, they terrorized the other tribes, in particular the Navajo. Uh, the history tells us the Utes are basically helped to drive the Navajo out of what they consider to be their Garden of Eden, an area in, in Colorado, the San Luis Valley. And as a result, uh, just to capsulize it, they believe that the Navajo put a curse on them, that, the, that basically the Navajo sent a skinwalker after them. And it's the skinwalker that lives in that property, in that ranch, in that area, or travels through it, uh, and it's that sort of umbrella explanation that they've come up with for all the weird stuff that they've been seeing uh, over the last many, many decades. They think there's a skinwalker there. It was put there to terrorize them and scare them. And for that reason, the Utes have an unofficial, I don't know, it might be official, but at least an unofficial ban that says that their tribal members are not supposed to go on the property. They take it that seriously. Uh, in 1994, this family, the Gormans, bought the property. They didn't know much about its history, very little, except that it had been vacant for seven years. And the previous owners, who had moved, I think, to Salt Lake City, uh, were a little bit strange. They included in the deed a, a condition that they weren't supposed to do any digging on the property. No digging unless you get advanced uh, per, uh, permission in advance from the family. I thought that was odd. Maybe these people are just old and eccentric, so they signed it and, and went along with it. I know in recent weeks I've seen uh, some reports online that that condition is not true, but I'm telling you I've read the deed and it is. Um, so the Gormans notice at the property, in addition to that, that the uh, wolf on the first day, they see these great big stakes at both of the doors with heavy chains that indicated that there had been big guard dogs there. They noticed that all the doors, even interior doors, have locks on both sides, that cabinets have locks, on, uh, locks way beyond what would be normal, as if they were afraid of something coming in or getting out, or as if the doors and windows and things of that sort would open on their own, which is exactly what turned out to be. There was a um, sort of a, an extensive menu of deeply disturbing things, and we'll get into some of the biggest incidents uh, forward, going forward, but it's the little things that happen that really get the hairs on my arm going up. These little poltergeist-type things that happened. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, things would move around on their own. Animate, inanimate objects somehow become animated, everyday tools, dishes, possessions seemingly pursue their own agendas. Uh, it's At first, it was simply irritating, and then it got a lot more serious. The dad, for example, is out in the field. He's using a post hole digger, which is a fairly heavy tool, digging holes to put a post in for his fencing. He stops for a second. He leans, leans it uh, up there against a tree. He brushes his brow, takes a sip of water. It's not 10 seconds later. He turns around, and it's gone. And they found it two weeks later, up 75 feet up in a cottonwood tree. Um, the mom, uh, Ellen, she goes to town to buy groceries. And she'll buy a couple of weeks' worth so they don't have to run back and forth. It's a ranching community, you, you know, or family, and you want to be somewhat self-sufficient. Brings all these bags in, puts them on the kitchen table, takes everything out in the bags and puts it in the cupboard. She walks out of the living, uh, into the living room, then walks back in. All the stuff's back out of the cupboards in the bags again. Weird. She takes a, uh, she takes a shower every morning, and she has the same routine. She goes into the bathroom. She locks the door. She has a towel and a hairbrush, and she puts them on the cabinet there. She gets out and uses them. But a couple of times when she get out, the door's still locked, but the towel and the hairbrush are gone. Stuff like that. They start seeing shapes and shadows in the house. At night, they'd wake up and they'd hear the sounds of heavy footsteps in the hall or in the kitchen. And later, right, what sounded like right outside their room. They get up and investigate, don't see anything. Uh, large, dark, humanoid figures then would start appearing at their windows and later at the foot of their bed in the middle of the night and then poof, they'd vanish. Uh, the family got rattled, needless to say. They started hearing disembodied voices at night, speaking in a language that they'd never heard before. Uh, the husband and wife are out walking around in their yard, it's a nice evening, and they're hearing these voices talking, which sounds like 20 feet, 10 feet above their head in this strange language. What the hell is this chattering away? It sounded like more than one of them in this conversation. 
And the rancher yelled at it, hey, knock it off. And it stops for a second. And then it resumes in sort of a, a contemptuous way, like, ha, 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 you can't stop us. You know, it's, it was that kind of a tone from whatever these guys were saying, these invisible chatterboxes. Uh, again and again, everyday objects like frying pans and spatulas and tools would move or disappear, reappear. They'd turn up in odd places. You know, things would turn up in the freezer or in the dishwasher, the kind of stuff that we would consider classic poltergeist activity. On some nights, the entire homestead would be bathed in light, like it's just a giant diffused spotlight in the sky that makes everything light up. And then on other nights, there'd be beams of light coming out of the ground as if there's a spotlight under there or something. Uh, frequently, the family would hear these loud noises, mechanical noises, under the earth, like there's an underground railroad under there or a steel mill or something uh, under the dirt. Uh, and I have interviewed half a dozen other people who live in the region who's, who've heard this same thing. Uh, they saw a lot of weird animals. Uh, the wolf incident from day one, that was just one of the incidents. Ellen, the wife, had her own encounter with this wolf that was like the size of a horse. She gets out of the gate to open it up so she can get her car in coming home one day. And here this thing comes up, and it's big enough to where it's up to the top of her car. It's back. And it was traveling, not with another wolf, but with a great big dog, a big black dog whose head was way too big for its body. Why a wolf and a dog with a great big head travel together like that, well, that's, you know, that's for somebody else to figure out. Uh, the family saw a lot of animals that didn't seem to belong in that area, including a, a flock of these exotic and unknown birds, really bright red birds, like something that had just flown in from a gig in the Amazon forest or something. Uh, no birds matching their description had ever been seen in that area uh, before or since. Um, but they were there for a couple of days. Uh, here's a weird one. Uh, one afternoon as Tom and Ellen arrive at their ranch after shopping in town, they see a commotion in one of the corrals. Their horses are jumping up and down. They see a big cloud of dust. Something's messing with their animals. Tom jumps out of the uh, car or the truck and starts running toward it. And what this thing was is this, it's kind of a combination of a hyena and a dog. Great, big, muscular, hunched over with a, with a big red tail like a fox. It looked like a combination of a dog, hyena, and fox, and it was toying with the horses. It was like, uh, it was in no hurry. It had these claws that were just scratching the horse's um, legs, and it cut them, cut them up. Tom is running over there. This thing sees him, and it bolts up toward the ridge, up, goes up this hill, and just vanishes. It didn't jump into a hole. Uh, it didn't uh, hide in a burrow. It just went poof in the air. Uh, but he knows he didn't imagine it. He went back and saw the wounds on the horses. They were bleeding. So you had the, um, the bulletproof wolves, the assorted animals, the mystery voices, the strange lights, the poltergeist events. What else could possibly happen? Well, of course, cue the UFOs, and there were a bunch of them. The first one they saw would look like a recreational vehicle. Uh, Tom and his son are walking uh, down into the first homestead. They see a, what they think are a pair of headlights in the third homestead. Now again, there's only one way to get in, one way to get out. You have to go right by the ranch house. And it looks like a big boxy Winnebago. And I wonder how the hell did that guy get in there? He, how did we not see him go by us? Well, it looks like he's stuck down there. We'll walk down and go ahead and help him out. So they go walking in that direction. And suddenly this thing starts coming toward him. And you can see it's moving. And then it starts moving not toward them, but up. And it rises up above the cottonwood trees, boom takes off into the sky and disappears. Next, they started seeing these things like, they called them flying refrigerators or chupas that generated huge beams of light all over the property and made loud noises like somebody was banging metal inside of them. Uh, Tom and Ellen had a classic uh, daylight sighting of a classic flying saucer, a disc, except this one seemed to generate an emotional response in them as they watched it. I mean, they were like elated, almost giddy, uh, way out of proportion for what they were seeing, as if it was touching some kind of emotional button inside their heads. And that would happen again, but in a different way. There were other uh, saucer activity. Uh, there were craft, something that looked like an F-17 uh, stealth fighter, but it had these multicolored lights, like Christmas lights around the edges of it. The neighbors saw, and I interviewed them, saw what looked like flying sombreros that flew directly into the ridge as if it was almost a, a generated image that flew right in the ridge without causing a crash. Uh, then these orbs started showing up. First, they were little tiny white objects 
flitting around in the trees, almost playful, and they would see them at all, all, all times of the evening and always maintained their kind of their distance. And then they started seeing these, uh, these red orbs that proved to be a lot more aggressive since they, they often would fly into the cattle and scare the hell out of the cattle, just run them off, cause them to stampede. And then they started seeing these larger orange orbs that uh, generated an intense light. Uh, some of them almost looked like a sun. They were so big. And Tom, uh, the, the rancher, would use his scope to look at them. And he said that on occasion, it looked like you could see another sky on the other side. I mean, if it was appearing, these things would appear at dusk. And the other so side of this thing was blue, was blue sky. He, on occasion, would see things coming in and out. Uh, like craft coming in and out of these orbs. So they're, they're seeing all kinds of stuff flying around. Um, in addition to the white ones and the red ones, they started seeing these blue orbs, and they, I call them the blue meanies because they were mean. They were, they were bigger than a softball, uh, and it looked like they were made out of glass. And inside was a, a liquid, a blue liquid, that would swirl around. And the reaction to these things was pretty dramatic. Uh, Tom and Ellen both describe it as, uh, the, in the same way, is that it, again, seemed to touch the, the fear centers in their brain because it would, it would not only scare horses and cattle, but did the same thing to humans. I mean, just drive you to your knees, make you so scared. I mean, you know, after a while, they get used to seeing weird stuff out there. They're not as easy to frighten. But these things, way out of proportion, uh, fear beyond anything that they had ever described, uh, which would be, you know, a pretty interesting technology to have. Uh, another UFO that made occasional appearances with this uh, was like what I said, the F-117 things. Uh, Tom saw one one night. Uh, it was a cold night. He starts going out there under the presumption that maybe the government's trying to scare him off his property or something. So at night, he's grabbing his gun. He's going out and hiding around to see what he can see. This thing, he, it's real cold, and he's, he's hiding to watch it as it's shining a spotlight down on the property as if it's looking for something, and his bones just kind of cracked, and this thing heard it and reacted, and then started looking for him. And uh, he went back to the house, uh, not surprisingly. Um, weeks later, um, Mrs. Gorman had her own sighting of this same thing. Tom's out of town on business. She comes home, opens the gate, and she sees this thing uh, floating just off of her property. As she goes down the, the road toward the ranch house, it's shadowing her. It's following her. She goes in the house. She's scared. She locks all the doors. Uh, turns out the lights. She calls him on the phone and says, hey, you got to come home here. This is something really weird going on. He says, hey, I'm, I'm, he's 250 miles away. I can't come home right now. So she's going to gut it out. She sees this thing land in the pasture right outside, 50 yards away from the house. And it's a great big uh, recreational vehicle looking thing. And the door is open. There's light spilling out. And as weird as it sound, it looks like an office. What she can see in there is a desk and a chair and an office. And uh, so she'd come back every once in a while and take a peek, and pretty soon this big Darth Vader-looking thing, wearing what looks like a black motorcycle helmet, comes and sits, and great big Nazi-type boots, comes and sits at this desk and just starts looking in her direction. Well, she's scared to death, as you can imagine. Again, closes the curtains and hides. And now Tom gets the message from his wife. He decided to come home after the third or fourth urgent call. He drives all night, gets there in the morning, goes out and looks at that area, and there were indentations where something had landed and, and big boot prints in the, in the, uh, in the grass there. I, uh, I'll jump out of chronological order for a second uh, to tell about uh, two other incidents that I think don't easily fit in any category. During this period where all these assorted lights and craft are dancing around and zipping over the ranch, uh, Tom Gorman made this uh, unusual discovery in the third homestead. This is actually what caused Bob Bigelow to get interested in the property, is that something dug up the ground. It was like you took a giant cookie cutter and dug 50 or 60 holes in the third homestead and lifting hundreds of pounds of soil out and took off with it. Now again, if somebody had a backhoe out there, uh, he would have seen it, he would have heard it, nobody came in, nobody went out. How they took all the soil, what the purpose was, why it was all these cookie cutter type indentations, he didn't know. But he was getting pretty tired of it. So he started asking his neighbors, what the heck's going on? Can you tell me about this property? Um, and he started hearing little bits and pieces about its history. This second incident happened 
Um, after actually a, a newspaper story was done about these indentations, a photo was taken. It, it was picked up by the Associated Press. A friend of Bob Bigelow saw it. That's how he got onto the ranch. In the meantime, other people started hearing about it. So there's a day comes when somebody shows up at the property, wanted to get in. A guy who said he'd driven for, for days, that he was drawn by some mysterious force to meditate. And he's got, you got to let me in. I got to sit on the property and meditate somewhere and commune with nature or whatever. And the, Tom is, is not a meditate kind of guy. And he's kind of laughing at this guy a little bit, chuckling. All right, buddy, come on, leave your car there. You can come with us. We'll take you in the middle homestead and you can meditate. So he's, this guy was big, like a Grizzly Adams type guy, big beard and everything. And he sits down. No, he's standing. He's standing in the, in the middle of this, uh, this homestead area. And, uh, and Tom and his kid are kind of looking from afar, kind of chuckling to themselves. And they started hearing, after this guy's doing his thing for a couple of minutes, they started hearing cowbells. Their cows don't have any cowbells on them. So they're hearing this noise, and it's kind of over in the thicket, back where the wolf had disappeared. And they're looking, and this guy's paying no attention to it. They're looking, and they see something moving through the trees, through the, through the bushes, something hard to define, kind of opaque. And they're just about to tell this guy, hey, something's coming at you. You, you better pay attention to this. When this thing comes out of the bushes, it's like uh, you've seen the movie Predator, where he has that camouflage kind of thing on. That's what this looked like, this big, opaque sort of camouflage device. It comes rushing out of the trees right up to this Grizzly Adams guy and lets out this roar. And uh, Tom had said before, uh, afterward, when he was interviewed by the NIDS guys, it's a roar you probably could have heard for miles. Just incredibly loud. Scared the hell out of this guy who had his eyes closed. He opens them up, this thing's in front of him screaming. He goes flying back and falls on the ground, and then this thing takes off. Uh, Tom goes rushing over, hey buddy, you okay? Guy was so scared, he grabs onto him and won't let go. Um, and, and eventually Tom had to say, hey, you're going to have to let go of me or I'm going to have to punch you. And the guy is, uh, he, he says, get me out of here, let me out of here. They take him to the ranch, I mean to the gate the, to the ranch and let him go. And he's screaming that the place is haunted, it's got demons, it's the work of Satan, and he, off he drove. Um, I will add one other personal anecdote, and then we'll move into the NIDS part of this story, is that when I made my first visit to the ranch, they decided that I, maybe I had, it was at a time when the level of activity had gone way down. And they decided maybe I had uh, some inherent weirdness quotient that might get something going. So they took, us out to, took me out to the spot where, uh, where this had happened with this guy, where they also had had several animal mutilations, right in this middle homestead, which seems to be the center of the activity. They had told me there were certain things that seemed to get this thing riled up, whatever it was. The most important one being digging in the dirt. So in, in anticipation of my, the use of me as a guinea pig, we got the earth mover out, we dug around, moved a bunch of dirt, we built a big fire out on the property, we made a bunch of noise dancing around. I tried to get it riled up. And then they took me to this tree, at this, uh, and they put me on this little white plastic chair at this spot, put a couple of microphones and, and other things on me, so that if something came and grabbed me, they'd be able to figure out what it was. And they left me there in the middle of the night, in the darkness. So they went 300 yards away. They had some telescopes. They're watching. Everybody's having a darn good time. And I'm sitting there at this. I'm thinking to myself, look, I don't mind if a flying saucer comes over, but I really don't want to see that predator thing, you know, or whatever it is that's cutting up cows. Uh, the fact is uh, uh, nothing came and got me except for mosquitoes. I would like to tell you that I was perfectly brave and I didn't think anything was going to come and get me, but that is not the fact. Uh, it, it was a, there was a spooky couple of moments there. And I've since sort of got used to being out there on the, on the property uh, by myself since then, but for, the, for a first brush with it, it was, it was pretty spooky. Um, as mentioned, it was sort of like a, a, a paranormal shopping list, and it gets to the point where mentioning everything that happened there is just ridiculous. I mean, some of the things that weren't, weren't on the list, I, there was this powerful musk odor that would fill the air of the property at, at different times, this noxious smell that often preceded more dramatic events. Uh, they had numerous sightings of what we would call a, a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, this seven-foot-tall, eight-foot-tall humanoid dark things running across the property. Uh, some other kinds of large animals that could be felt but not seen. Uh, they would watch it. It would move through the water in these canals. You could see something was displacing water. You could see it getting out and water dropping off, but it was like invisible. Something would move through the cattle on occasions, as if just dividing them, uh, like a car was slowly driving through them. Uh, there were uh, what, almost the equivalent of crop circles there as well, a huge 
circular impressions that were left on the grass. They had three circles that appeared one time, all at the same time, eight feet in diameter, perfectly arranged in a triangular pattern, 30 feet away from each other. Um, and all of this, of course, was taking its toll on the family. As you might imagine, the kids' grades went downhill. Uh, Mom lost her job in town. Uh, by the time Nids got there, this perfect American family was a wreck. They were all sleeping at night on the floor in one room for protection, and um, they were a wreck. I mean, in, in part, they believed that it was uh, the government was doing it or someone was trying to get them off their property, and eventually they realized, I, I don't think the government could do this kind of stuff. Although on occasion, helicopters and things like that would fly over, and, and they did feel that there was some interest by military elements, though there's no base within 200 miles. Uh, bad things started happening to their animals, dogs and cats in addition to cattle that we'll get into in a moment. Um, dogs and cats being carved up. There was one night that eight of their cats just disappeared. They had these big, tough country dogs uh, that weren't afraid of anything, living out there in the, in the, the wilderness, kind of, and able to take care of themselves that were carved up a couple of times or disappeared. Um, I'll jump out of order again and tell you this, chrono uh, this story about something that happened to family pets because it, it heralds the entrance of NIDS. It's at a time when Tom Gorman was sort of like hanging on to this property by his fingernails. Uh, he didn't want to surrender his dream, you know, uh, to this collection of crazy stuff. But he realized something beyond him was going on. He's out on the porch one night, back porch, talking on the phone to a friend of mine. And he's got these big, three big dogs that are attracted to something. It's one of the blue meanies that had come out of the area of the, the thicket, the brush. And it's toying with the dogs. It's jumping up and down, just out of the reach of it. They're snapping jaws. They're going after it. And it, it starts drawing these dogs back toward the thicket. And he's telling me, hey, something's really going on here. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to get back to you. And he hangs up the phone. And just as he hangs up the phone, the dogs and this blue thing disappear. And then he hears, a couple of seconds later, these blood-curdling shrieks, these animals in pain. Um, he was a very brave guy, but on this occasion did not go out there into the thicket. It was already dark. The next morning he goes and looks, and he finds these three greasy spots on the dirt as if these things had just been vaporized. Dogs never seen again. That was pretty much the last straw for him, thinking, hey, man, this is not a place that my family needs to be. Um, and then, of course, things happening to the cattle. I, I won't go into all the instances. We're going to play some video here again. OK. Um, you know, we all know basic, the basics about the mutilation cases. He starts having a bunch of them. These are very expensive, I'll tell you in a second, very expensive uh, animals. They're very, very expensive. And he lost, I think, all told, 14 head. Uh, in the beginning, they would just be poof, kind of gone. Uh, in one case, the tracks from a 1,200-pound cow led out into a snowbank and then gone. They end, end right there. In another case, uh, Gorman's son went out and checked on a cow who was in the field, and five minutes later, they found it sliced to pieces. It's rectum cored out, um, and no blood on the cow, no blood on the snow. Who did it and how, they still don't know. Uh, Gorman's next-door neighbor lost a whole bunch of cattle. Uh, in one instance, this guy, I call him Mr. Gonzalez, but I interviewed him a couple of times, uh, he saw one of his cows out in the field separated from the rest of the herd and it somehow got under a fence and was in a part of the pasture it didn't belong. He goes, wow, what the heck is that doing out there? He goes, he's going to go outside and go shoo it back in. He gets out there and it had two of it, its two front legs were broken and it's, it had fallen down like it had been dropped or something or somebody had, had used a baseball bat on its legs. This thing is in pain, it's dying. He goes back in the house, he's going to get a gun and put it out of its misery, comes back out, the cow's gone. He's thinking to himself, well, no, that thing didn't walk off on its own. A little while later, he's looking out the window again, cow's back, it's laying in the same spot. He goes back outside with his gun, this time it has all four legs are broken, as if it had been dropped, you know, and, uh, and hurt. And I guess he ended up uh, killing it, putting it out of its misery, but um, pretty weird little instance. There was an instance with uh, Tom and Ellen. Now, you, you heard Bob Bigelow in that piece of video there talk about how it seemed to anticipate, this intelligence, whatever it was, would seem to anticipate what people were going to do. Tom and Ellen are driving to, to town. They just talked to each other about, man, we've lost a lot of cows. We lose any more, we're going to go under. They had these four prized bulls, Semental bulls, 
very expensive animals, 2,000 pounds each, mean, surly, powerful animals that they have in this corral. And they're saying to each other as they're driving to town, hey man, if something happens to, uh, not man, but <laughs> if something happens to one of these bulls, we're done, we'll be bankrupt. They drive back to town, from town, an hour later, all four of the bulls are gone. They're out of this corral. And they're running around frantic. Who stole our bulls? What the heck happened here? Did someone kill them? They're in the corral uh, is this metal trailer uh, that, has, that he used to store tools in, uh, sort of like a storage shed. It's made out of metal. There's only one way in. The, the, the door is wrapped with this real thick wire. And just as a lark, as he was out of ideas, Tom peeks in this grating at the top of this trailer, and there they are. All four of these bulls are crammed into this trailer, all up against each other, because there really isn't room enough to get in there. How you would get one of those bulls in that trailer is amazing. How you get all four of them in, there's no way to know it. He yells to his wife, hey, I found them. And when he says that, it's like they come out of a trance. Uh, and they start kicking the hell out of this thing, kicked the door off, and got out. Um, later on, the NIDS people came in. They, they did some tests. The whole corral had been magnetized, like somebody had used a giant magnet on it. Whoever did this thing and got those bulls into that, into that, um, that little enclosure uh, did something, used some kind of magnetic technology. Um, so NIDS comes in. I'll give you more details on that in a moment. I want to take you to a piece of video here. They're there on the property most of the time. They're very interested in investigating cattle mutilations. They had set up a network all over the West to, to get information about instances. They had veterinarians on the team. They leave the property one of the weekends, and this thing happens. Go ahead and roll it. That's, this particular instance is a good one. Their herd of 80 cattle consisted of high-end Semmental stock, each the product of Tom Gorman's expertise in artificial insemination. The loss of 14 valuable cows in a matter of months was devastating to the family's finances, but took a psychological toll as well. Across the country, dating back to the late 60s, hundreds of other ranchers in at least 15 other states experienced the same sense of frustration and helplessness upon discovering the grim evidence left behind by the mystery surgeons. At the Gorman Ranch, as elsewhere, the grisly handiwork was primarily carried out under the cover of darkness or during violent storms. The carved carcasses were mostly found hours or days later during daylight. Even in sunlight, the discovery of an animal sliced up so precisely was chilling and deeply disturbing, and then it got worse. On March 10, 1997, Tom Gorman and his wife walked out of their home and into the pasture, planning to tag the ears of several calves that had been born in the preceding days. It was a bright, clear morning. Snow was on the ground. Fifty yards from their house, they found the first calf. As they were with their, their dog, uh, the, the two of them uh, tagged and weighed this animal. They, they checked it at, I believe it was 84 pounds or 87 pounds, and they left the animal there with the, with the mother. Everything seemed to be fine, although they did detect an odor in the air. Around this uh, area, they, they, they detected a strong musk smell. Um, they took note of it, and then they headed west, and they went about 300 yards west beyond. The, the dog run was, is not, was not there at the time. But about 300 yards beyond, um, towards where that incline is, um, and they were tagging a second animal. Only 30 to 40 minutes had passed. The Gormans had an unobstructed view of everything in the field, but didn't see or hear anything unusual until their dog focused its attention back toward the house and the first calf. The dog with them down here at this stage began to act really strangely. It started growling, the hair on the back of its neck went up and it started facing back towards here, growling and snarling. And then it just took off west, away from this spot. It just took off. It was never seen again. The Gormans were curious and walked back across the field. First thing they saw was the mother of the animal was running back and forth, kind of in a, in a, um, a sort of half circle from about this area to the fence line, just running back and forth, and it was limping. I mean, it was dragging its foot, it was limping. 
they met the animal, um, and they noticed that it was just totally out of breath. It was panting. It was obviously in deep stress, and it was dragging one leg. And then they noticed the cat, or what was left of it, spread eagled on the ground, just about here. With uh, it, was, it was lying with all four limbs just spread on the ground. All of its internal body cavity was gone. Um, it was completely, pretty well, all of its uh, muscle was gone from, the, from the, the torso. The legs were still intact, but the um, one of the ears was also gone. So they called NIDS. The rancher placed a call to the NIDS investigators who'd returned to Las Vegas for a rare weekend off. Within a few hours, a four-man team, including a veterinarian, was on the scene. Necropsy started, and the first thing that the veterinarian noticed during the necropsy was that the, uh, the ear of the animal had been sliced off with a very sharp, possibly a scalpel, and the ear had contained a very large plastic yellow um, tag, like a, 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 an ear tag, that they had just put on, and it was gone. So, um, the necropsy proceeded, um, about 10 feet away from the animal was a femur. One of the femurs had been forcibly ripped out of a ball and socket joint, which is extremely difficult to do, I mean, in terms of strength. It looked initially, you know, superficially, like a massive predator had just laid waste to this animal, removed, you know, 60 pounds of meat in 45 minutes, which we don't know of any predator that could have done that. And how could a predator inflict such carnage without being seen or heard by the rancher, his wife, or his dog, who were a few hundred yards away in the same field on what was a quiet Sunday morning? No four-legged predator known to science could do it. The team gathered tissue and bone samples, which were sent to three independent pathology labs. The results arrived later, but confirmed what seemed obvious in the pasture that day. The calf had been carved up by someone wielding sharp, metallic instruments. A heavy machete-like object had slammed into the bones. A smaller, scalpel-like knife had sliced the hide and muscle. Closer inspection revealed that it was definitely sharp instruments used. There was no sign of blood. There was no sign of entrails around. It was perfectly clean. Uh, not a drop of blood on the grass. We went even as far as doing an experiment by pouring blood on the grass to see how fast it would see through. Video taken the grass and showed, you know, even two days later you could still see the stain on the grass. So there was no blood whatsoever, not a single drop, either underneath the animal, on the animal, or on the grass. It was just completely clean. A professional tracker was brought in. He scoured every inch of ground in and around the field, looking for tracks, human, animal, or vehicle. Nothing. Eventually, the investigators reached an unsettling conclusion. The bottom line is this animal must have been killed elsewhere because there was no blood. There was no blood on the scene, and then the animal must have been brought back, laid down carefully, almost, you know, really almost ritually on the spot where it had been tagged. There is no flesh. They got it all. For the next couple of days, it was kind of a weird uh, feeling at the ranch. The big, the other dogs that he'd got wouldn't come out of their proper uh, other dog houses. They were scared. It was like there was some giant predator running around out there. And a couple of nights later, the dogs start barking, and the rancher jumps up, grabs a gun, jumps in his truck. The NIDS guys, Colum and another PhD, get in their truck and start following him. He jams across the, the, the ranch land right near where the, that mutilation had occurred, pretty close to the ranch house and he stops and they're behind him. They're, they shot video of this thing and I've got a couple of clips of it. He sees something in the, in the tree. There's great, two great big eyes, like big yellow eyes up in this tree. And at the bottom is a big round uh, unknown object, looked like a big fat bear. And he shot it. He shot this thing and it went away, poof. And then he turned a gun on what the, the eyes that were in the, in the tree. He shot it and it fell. It fell out and there's snow at the bottom of the ground and it left a, a, a print. There's no blood, but it left one print and it's like three great big talons and then one behind it, like a, like a raptor of some sort. Now he said he thought it looked like a big dinosaur. Um, and they, he, the rancher starts chasing this thing through the brush. Pretty soon the tracks are gone and he can't find it. The NIDS guys came up behind it shooting video uh, of this, the, the impression in the snow, and then they went in the bushes as well. While they were there, as I said, they were there for seven years, they did what scientists are supposed to do. They tried to weed this out. 
They uh, surveyed the property for geomagnetic anomalies, tried to figure out if there's, you know, uh, natural lights that are causing this. They did a survey of all the plants uh, to see if there's any psycho, uh, psychotropic effects. They surveyed plants in the whole region to see if they were windborne. They interviewed neighbors. They set up cameras. Every step they took, the kinds of things they're supposed to do to find out if there are other explanations for all this, uh, did what some scientists are supposed to do, but every step they took, this thing was one step ahead of them. You put the cameras in a place where these things have been flitting up and down for weeks, you put the camera there, and it's gone. Then it happens over here. Put the camera over here, it's back over here. Uh, there is some video that they got and photos of some of these orbs, but it's, you know what it's like taking a, a shot of something at a distance, a light in a, in a sea of inky darkness of limited value. Um, you know, they did everything they're supposed to do and, and could not figure it out and still can't. There was one instance, I'll tell you this, and then we'll maybe take some questions, of something that, that, that happened to them. Uh, Column, Dr. Kelleher, and another PhD physicist are walking along at night. They got a couple of dogs with them in the middle homestead again. They got two guys up on the ridge with infrared who are watching from above, and they see what looks like a dirty snowball of light uh, hovering off the ground, about two feet off the ground. The guys up top say, hey, are you seeing this? And they're talking by walkie-talkie. No, we don't see it. Oh, yeah, there it is. This thing starts getting longer, like stretching out, until it becomes, over the course of a couple of minutes, it stretches into what looks like a tunnel of light. And the guys up top are saying, hey, man, this is really strange. The guys in the bottom are still seeing it just as a, a dirty snowball. They don't see the tunnel. Only the ones with infrared do it, uh, do see it. The guys up top tell them, hey, something's coming through. you got to get out of there. And they watch as this thing wriggles through this tunnel, this great big black object, the humanoid figure that wriggles its way through this tunnel of light as if it's coming from somewhere else. And it gets out at the top of the, this tunnel and it stands up. It's like eight feet tall, dark humanoid, featureless face. And then it starts running up the hill. The guys up there think it's coming for us. They were scared, as you might imagine. And they beat it off in the, in the next direction. Uh, these guys down here didn't see anything. Um, and it was that kind of mind games that, that really became frustrating for the team. Eventually, uh, the activity level just went down. Um, whatever it was, uh, they, as sort of a parting gesture, went up these telephone poles and ripped out all these cameras um, in, a, in a fairly dramatic fashion, as if to say, these are not welcome. And uh, eventually NIDS gave up, it disbanded and, and went away. But you know, you're, you're left with, how do you explain that? What paper do you write? Uh, it took me a long time to talk him into allowing me, I mean, I was privy because of my friendship with Bob, that I was privy to some of these reports as they came in from the ranch. Uh, it was driving me crazy that I'm not allowed to tell anybody about it. So it took me a long time to even talk him into allowing me to go on the property. And I had every intention of producing a documentary about it, which is what uh, some of that footage came from eventually decided it would cause more harm than, than good. But um, this, the study ended, the team was gone, Bigelow still owns the property, uh, but the level of activity during the height of when NIDS was there uh, has never returned. It's as if the whole dynamic of the relationship changed. While it was in charge and enjoyed scaring the hell out of anybody who was there and playing tricks on them, things were fine. When somebody started stalking it, everything changed and whatever it is didn't seem to like it, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, you know, there are a couple of possibilities you can look at. I don't think the Gormans were lying, because even if they were lying about things they saw, they surely didn't make up all the stuff around them that had been seen by hundreds of other witnesses. Uh, we did not rule out entirely the possibility that the military is doing something out there, but, you know, that's some pretty cool technology, those, glow, those b blue glass balls with no known uh, propulsion that can instill fear in people. That's, that's some pretty handy stuff. And if the military is doing it, though, what special commando team gets this job? Okay, you sneak into the, the locked bathroom and steal her hairbrush. You know, what, what Delta Force guy gets that assignment? Uh, I think in the end that I'm, uh, I'm left with, uh, you know, some, uh, my own ideas about it. It's some sort of a learning curve that it's maybe telling us that all these things that we think of as paranormal are related on, on some kind of level. That reality isn't what it seems, and reality isn't what it used to be. That maybe we really do just start to have to think outside the box. There's a phrase that Jacques Vallée had in, in his book, Passport to Magonia. He called it patterns of deliberate unbelievableness. 
uh, and it's found throughout UFO literature, if you think about it, things that are just so weird that nobody you tell about is going to believe it. And that's really uh, where it remained for the guys from NIDS. You know, you, the study was not perfect by any means. And, uh, you know, in looking back, in retrospect, a lot of armchair critics would say, this is what you should have done, or you should have done it that way. And yeah, may maybe there could have been other approaches. Within NIDS, they debated it themselves. Maybe we should have never done a technological approach. We shouldn't have had all the scientific gear or put all these cameras. Maybe it should have been something where we just have shaman or remote viewers or psychics and try to develop uh, some kind of a rapport or relationship. They did that kind of stuff, but it didn't work. Uh, and at one point, I know they, they felt they were close to developing some sort of a communication with it, but it didn't work, ultimately. But I think it shows what these guys did is, you know, it's what science is supposed to do. And that is I investigate the unexplained, not explain the uninvestigated. And uh, thank you very much. Take some questions if you want. We've got a, got a minute or two. Uh, Bigelow still owns the property. He has a, a couple of caretakers who are on it. And as I mentioned, he's, uh, we, we went back, it's two years ago when the trespassing got really bad. And I volunteered, hey, I'll go there. I'll go scare the hell out of him. I'll chase somebody off. Just uh, sit me at the front gate. And we did. He, he flew me up. Uh, he, Bigelow and his chief of security and me, chief of security guy was packing, a, packing some heat. He was on one side. And they stuck me at the front. And I was wearing this camo gear and a bear spray, and they gave me a walkie-talkie and a million candle power spotlight. And sure enough, uh, it wasn't an hour sitting out there, people start coming up to the front gate, and I'm sitting in a chair kind of uh, off into the bushes, waiting for somebody to show up. I think uh, this, this truck pulls right up, it coasts real quiet, lights are off, three people are in it, a uh, uh, woman and two men, and they start to get out, and I thought, oh, they've seen me. So I pop out, slam on this million candle power uh, spotlight, and they go, ah! They slam this truck into gear and get peeled on backwards down this road. I figure by the time that story got to, onto the internet, it was I was a nine foot tall Bigfoot with a laser beam or something. <laughs> Second night, the same thing happened. It's, and we tried to get the word out that security was there, you're not welcome, and it's continued. And they, they have beer parties and throw trash all over, and, and it's a big mess. So he has, still owns the property. He still has people there on occasion but the level of activity has gone way down. The family moved away. Uh, for a while while NIDS was there, they, they had moved to another part of the Uinta Basin, but the ranch, uh, the, the former owner, they kept him on as sort of a foreman because he really wanted to get to the bottom of it. And that went on for a while, and then things got too weird for him. So they moved to another state. I will tell you this, that for a while it followed him. That, that it followed him. They had, they had some experiences for a while, and then it went away. Uh, I think that some of them, at least part of the fa the kids have gone on their own lives by now, but the, uh, I think the rancher moved back to that area, uh, at, which is where he's living now. Yes, in the back. Never actually heard of human being. No, never heard of a human being other than psychologically. Uh, the rancher, the husband and wife, the only physical harm that happened to them was they, they would have the same dreams often at night that they were going somewhere else and they'd wake up with these marks on their hands, uh, on their thumbs sort of like what some abductees have reported. As far as they know, they were never abducted and went through the whole anal probe thing, but uh, no, no, no humans were hurt. Animals were certainly hurt. So whatever was doing it could make some sort of a moral distinction between people and cows and dogs, um, but it was pretty scary nonetheless. Yeah. There's some, uh, you know, there's a lot that's been, of course, a lot of online uh, chatter about this. There's a couple of uh, folks who have taken up residence around the property. And have I just say this is to take it with a grain of salt, uh, because there are a lot of people who decided as a lark, you know, they're going to go to Skinwalker Ranch for a weekend. Well, what do you know? They all have encounters and strange beings invisible come out and scare them, you know, and I think it's a lot of wishful thinking. I understand that. I understand why people would be drawn to it and be curious. Just, you know, um, take it with a grain of salt. Yes? Over what years did the Mormons own this ranch, and did they try taking any video of any of these like the man sitting at the desk? 
Um, the Gormans did not. I mean, keep in mind, they're ranchers. You know, they, they bought it in 94. I think they were owned it for 20 months. That's how long they held on. Um, and then after that, ever since, uh, Bigelow has owned it. Uh, I don't think that they ever tried to take any video. They wanted to go away. You know, they're not UFO investigators, and I know it drives us crazy sitting here from this vantage point that they didn't, uh, but the NIDS team did attempt videos, and there are some, and I've seen them, and they're of dubious value. As I said, a, 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 an anomalous light in a sea of inky darkness is almost no value at all. Um, we did want to put photos. There are some photos, including some of the cattle mutilation stuff and tracks and things that they had, had tracked. Um, in the book, but I didn't have permission until it was too late. Uh, included in this, if I wasn't such a knucklehead, I could show you some more video. Uh, the video of the track in the snow, for example, and a couple of other choice things. But in general, whatever it was, avoided this kind of thing. You would be able to see it with your eyes, but not on in, through binoculars or infrared. Or you'd see it through infrared, but not with your eyes. Uh, it was confounding and frustrating. Well, what department? I think there probably is some interest in that at some level. But what do you do? I mean, what do you, you go out there to study it. It calls the shots. If it doesn't want you to know about it, you don't. And, um, and I think there probably have been people who have expressed interest. I know that uh, I interviewed a rancher who has a property next door who used to be a partners with Terry Gorman, and I found him just a couple of years ago. And he told me that the Office of Naval Intelligence, somebody from ONI had been up there to interview him uh, about Terry Sherman, I'm sorry, Tom Gorman, and, um, and uh, the family, and mutilations and things of that sort. And he gave me a name. I had the guy's business card, and sure enough, he's a real person. Now, what, why the Navy was out there in the middle of Utah, I don't know. Not a whole lot of ocean out there. Yeah. You said that the property was surrounded by reservation. Yeah. Then where's the neighboring ranch? Well, there's, there is a ranch right next to, right in the same road that leads right up into the property is right next to him. And there's, there are other ranches that are surrounded by, by Indian land as well. There, there's not just one, it's a couple of them. Yes? Well, a witch can be male. Yeah, which is not just female. That's our un understanding of witches, but I mean, culturally, their witches can be male or female. Yeah. It sounds like the Marfa lights down in Texas. A little bit, but I don't know about Marfa lights covering up cows or chasing incinerating dogs. You know. Um, yes. It never followed the NIDS guys. They, they had some experiences while they were there, things that uh, really bothered them. But after they left, it didn't follow them home, as far as I know. All the way in the back. Did Linda get involved in the cattle I'm sorry? Did Linda involved in the cattle? Linda, Linda was not involved in investigating this stuff. They wanted to keep it sort of a close, close in. I, I know that Linda, has, Linda Howe has worked with Bob Bigelow in the past, but she was not involved in this. Yes. Uh, no, uh, not, not at the inst the question is whether lasers were used in these cattle mutilations. No, it was good old fashioned knives that were used or some kind of cutting instrument. There was no indication of high heat as, as Linda has reported about some of the cases she's investigated. Yes. Were the Utes aware of all this activity while it was going on? What was their reaction? The Utes are aware of it. We've, uh, I tried to interview them, uh, go through tribal means and they wouldn't talk to us. The guys from NIDS were successful in interviewing a couple of uh, police officers who worked for the tribe, and they had a great story. Uh, in fact, we, de we debated. We wanted to include everything in the book that we could without um, sort of censoring ourselves and just lay it out. And this is the only case, the only instance where we debated about whether to include it because it's just so damn weird. These two Indian uh, police officers came around the bend to the dirt road that leads into the ranch, it's at nighttime, and their headlights catch these two figures, these two people standing there, they thought were people, two guys in trench coats with their back to them, and they're smoking cigarettes. 
and they get out and they're wondering, what are these guys doing? They get out, hey, what are you guys doing? And the guys with the trench coats and smoking the cigarettes turn around and they're dogs. <laughs> they're dog faces. And they look at them and the, the cops look at each other and they turn around and they're gone. Um, just poof, vanished. But they did find cigarettes where they've been standing there smoking. Now, I thought, oh man, am I gonna tell that story? There's people with dog. We did, we put it in there, and since that time, I've been contacted by people who've seen these dog-faced uh, beings all over, the, all over the place. Not all over the place, but here and there. Um, th but there is a lore of dog men uh, in the literature. Yes? Were those plugs of earth were removed? Were the, was the uh, earth just missing, or were the plugs still? No, the earth was just gone. And it's hundreds of pounds of stuff, you know. Somebody, somebody needed equipment to carry it out of there. But it's just like somebody went down and plucked it out and took off with it. Anything else? Yes? Did anyone contact the previous owners and ask them why they had specified no digging? Yes, um, yes. And it's a kind of an odd, there's, there's a tension there that I don't really understand. The previous owners did not want the Gormans to sell to Bob Bigelow. They were very upset about it and even tried to intervene and buy it back um, because they didn't want any kind of investigation going on. There has been talk back and forth, and it's bad blood, it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's way out of whack for what it is. There, the, as I mentioned uh, very briefly, is that there's a report online that I just saw that this thing about not digging uh, in the property is a bunch of baloney. We never said that, says the remaining members of the family. All we wanted them to do is not dig up our relatives who live there. Well, that's not what the deed said. It said, don't do any digging at all. And it, all you had to do is say, that's a graveyard and nobody, it's not a problem, but that's not what it said. Don't do any digging unless you get permission from us. And after, as the NIDS guys learned, that there was an ex, there, there's a sort of an explanation in that whenever you dug up and disturbed the earth, things happened. So somehow there was a, there was a, a general sense after talking to neighbors and others, the NIDS guys eventually concluded that whoever had lived there before uh, had developed some sort of a live and let live relationship with whatever it was uh, that they all got along.